I was born in India. The contradiction I grew up with is imagine now you're a four-year-old kid. If you can close your eyes and you can imagine that. And you have a really good friend of yours and you play soccer with him and you play all different games with him. And he's your friend. Mm -hmm. One day your friend says, oh, come on over to my house. It's a very hot day, maybe a hundred plus degrees in the Indian summer. You're sweating, you have no water, you played. And your friend invites you over to his home and you're going to his home with your soccer ball in your hand. This crazy woman, his mother comes out and starts calling you the N-word, the equivalent in, in Indian mm -hmm, language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're a child. You don't understand why she's so mad at you. Doesn't want you to even come into her home. Spits at the ground at you and says, you stand here, brings her son in and gives you water in a dirty cup, a filthy cup because you are a human being that is treated worse than a street dog that cannot come into her home. That's the experience I experienced as a four-year-old child. That's injustice. Mm -hmm. Then I had to unwind this story, this very powerful set of indignities, asking my mother, why did this woman do this? Then hearing from your mother that you were considered what they called a low caste shudra, which is like the N-word. Mm -hmm. My mother proceeded to tell me, as four-year-old now, mm -hmm. that when she used to go to the well to get water, they would chase her away like a pig. Mm -hmm. My mother said, we have a caste system and we are the lowest of the low. We were supposed to just pick coconuts the rest of our life. Other people over here are supposed to wash toilets the rest of their life. Over here, these people are just supposed to milk cows mm -hmm. the rest of their life and so on. This is called the caste system. I could see the right? correlations of why you're doing what you're doing now. That caste system was imposed in India when it was going away and I had to figure all this out. Many years later. Mm -hmm. What was his caste system? What is this system? I was fascinated by this, like deeply hurt, but wanted to understand this. As a kid, I started wanting to read books of great heroes, mm -hmm. be it Jesus Christ mm -hmm. or Rama, the great warrior, mm -hmm. or books I could get on great revolutionaries. I started to study from the time I was eight, nine, 10. I had studied left, right wing, all these people mm -hmm. who fought against this injustice. That's what motivated me. That's what fired me up because no one should suffer that kind of indignity right. ever. Why did a system exist that was enumerated in the government laws is actually you are this caste. Mm -hmm. You'll be treated like this. My parents were quite extraordinary people because my mother grew up in a household where the father ran away, which never occurs, ran away with a woman, nine kids. She was left essentially homeless. Mm -hmm. As an eight-year-old, my mother had to figure out that she had to stand up <clears throat> for herself. Women talk about women's liberation. My mom became liberated. She had to get educated on her own, got a ma mathematics degree as a woman. Mm -hmm. In fact, a master's in statistics, unheard of. Wow. Extraordinary woman, fighter, fierce fighter. My father grew up in war-torn Burma as a child, never saw a book. World War II, Burma was the center point of the fight between the Japanese and the so-called allies. My father grew up in this environment where his grandfather, my great-grandfather I knew, was an indentured servant, a slave who had left on a small indentured slave ship as a 12-year-old to make his fortune in Burma in the late 1800s. He lived up to 100-something. My great-grandfather left there to make his fortune. He started with nothing. Thing. He worked so hard on that slave ship. The captain of that ship said, I can't hold you in bondage. I've never seen anyone work this hard. And he left him out of his bonds. My great grandfather made his fortune in Burma. When World War II came, it was just devastation everywhere. My great grandfather, they had to leave back to India. He was quite an extraordinary person, a very deeply spiritual person. Your great grandfather. My great grandfather. What he did was he saw all these refugees and he took all of his land. He had hundreds of acres of land and he built homes for all the refugees. He gave it away and he left. He left with nothing from India, went to Burma, made a fortune, and came back with nothing. My great grandfather said you could judge a person by how they are with money, without money, and then with money. My dad's family literally walked back to India because it was wartime. Yeah. My dad said as a child, you would live in foxholes. You would see bombs coming. People would shit in their pants. That's how dangerous it was. But my great grandfather was a deep, deep believer in God. Mm -hmm. He would go out as bombs were falling and he would say, nothing will harm you. Very connected. When I grew up as a child, I'd experienced this horrible caste system. Then my grandparents lived in a very small village. Imagine if you see those old movies going to deep South Mississippi, no running water, mm -hmm. no electricity, dirt roads. No, yeah. Trust me. My family's from Vetiver, Bulgaria area. It's, it's that. Yeah. It's a farm. It's been there for generations. Right. No Same running thing. water. Yeah. Uh, toilet in the ground in the back. No even toilet in the ground. You have yeah. to go out into the woods. It's a hole in the ground. Right. But I'm talking, we'd yeah. have to walk into the woods. Yeah. But anyway, you, yeah, I get the, 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 idea. the, the point yeah. is that in that environment that I grew up in that village, my great grandfather learned a lot from it. He'd get up at four in the morning. This guy was ripped mm -hmm. at nineties, would work in the fields, 15, 16 hour days with my grandmother, small subsistence farm. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was a village healer. I mean, she wasn't some doctor. She had right. tattoos all over her arms, chewed tobacco. This woman 
on weekends, 30, 40 people would come to the home. She would observe their face. There's an ancient Indian technique called Samudrika Lakshanam. Mm -hmm. Here as a young kid, five, six years old, I'm seeing my grandmother observe people's faces, figure out what was their constitution, mm -hmm. what was wrong in their body, just by observing the face. Mm -hmm. She would make formulations for them. It could be meditation, like, uh, it could be sound. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, it could be many things. Yeah, yeah. It was sound, mind, body. People saw, don't know sound frequency, it, I think, is the future. I mean, it's the past too. It's but, one of the things. Yeah, it's, it, it's not any one thing. Yeah. It's multiple things. I saw her heal people. Mm -hmm. How was this woman with no degrees able to heal people in this small village with dirt roads? That fascinated me, this ancient system of medicine. Mm -hmm. And here, doctors who would never come to these villages. There's mm -hmm. another injustice here. The true thing was this woman was healing people, helping people, and she was considered the shaman in the village. My grandmother would go into trances. In our little small home, she had, if you looked across on the walls, were pictures of Jesus Christ, pictures of Brahma, pictures of Buddha, all these great deities. Because mm -hmm. the Hindu religion believes that Jesus Christ is a Messiah. Mm -hmm. He was sent to the world. He is a son of God, an avatar. But Hinduism also believes there are many avatars. Mm -hmm. in, in some ways, it generalizes that concept of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. It is completely absorbing of Christ and appreciating Christ, completely believes Christ is the son of God. I grew up in that world, seeing my uh, grandmother go into uh, different states of consciousness, start channeling. Mm -hmm. You would go into the home and there would be the smell of holy ash, like you would see in ancient Eastern Orthodox churches. Yeah. It was a very beautiful environment, mm -hmm. very primitive in some ways. Mm -hmm. That's the world I grew up in. In that world, I started developing this appreciation of systems, this love of very everyday people, the love of my mother who fought fought against this caste system, the love of my grandmother, who was able to heal people. The fact that my dad, who never saw a book until he was under a mango tree at the age of 12, and he ends up becoming a chemical engineer to one of the leading industrialists of India. Mm. That gentleman was moved by my dad's intelligence. My dad is raw intelligence. He could solve any problem from basic fundamentals. But here were these two extraordinary people who, by any regard, because of their caste, should just be picking coconuts their entire life. That was their caste destiny. They broke that destiny through sheer will mm -hmm. and fighting injustice. Mm -hmm. When my dad first came to the United States, he got the opportunity to come here. In fact, he was sent here as an engineer to get training mm -hmm. from a U.S. company. My dad was so good. The United States company said, we can't teach you anything. They invited him to come to the United States, I think 1968, 69. Mm -hmm. What's going on at that point is the Vietnam War. You have the civil rights movement taking mm -hmm. place. You have sex, drugs, and rock and roll. My dad comes here at that time with $75 in his pocket. And they wanted my dad to stay here. My dad was very loyal to his employer. He said, I'm not going to backstab my employer. He went back and he said, they want me to come there. They were trying to recruit me. I didn't think that was right. My dad's employer said, you should go because it'll be good for your family. And that's sort of this loyalty my dad bred in us. You know, mm -hmm. you're loyal to people who help you. Mm -hmm. After that, my dad came here, 75 bucks in his pocket. Mm -hmm. How um, old are you at this time? I think I was six, mm -hmm. 1969. Mm -hmm. My parents, my sister, myself, and my mom didn't see my dad for a year. Mm -hmm. Legal immigration. We have to wait in line. Mm -hmm. yep. Then in 19 1970, literally, we left India on December 2nd, which is my seventh birthday. Mm -hmm. I have this theory, things occur in cycles of seven. Yeah, numerology. Yeah. Is so we left big. on my seventh birthday. I left with shorts, right? Mm -hmm. Get on this TWA air flight. And I remember I'd never eaten this kind of food. I remember eating a ham sandwich. I almost threw up. I could still to this day taste the chemicals in that food. Mm -hmm. That's how deep it was. It tasted like garbage. Mm -hmm. I couldn't eat any of the food. Landed in John F. Kennedy Airport, mm -hmm. Kennedy. The irony. The irony. We landed and snowing. And I've never seen snow in my life. I have, I have shorts on. And my dad meets us. And I asked my dad, I remember this, why did you bring us here? And one word, he said, freedom. Mm -hmm. That is why my parents came here. Freedom. You go back to getting off this plane <laughs> as a kid. Yeah, no. Coming from India with this caste system. In India, they said these little comic books, not comic books of stupid Marvel heroes, but comic books of great revolutionaries. Mm. There's a guy called Subhash Chandra Bose who wanted to actually raise an army to violently kick the British out of India. I thought that was fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they deserved some violence upon them. Yeah. Christ put some violence into those people, right? Pharisees, yeah. My heroes were people like that. Mm -hmm. I read little comic books of people that were just emerging on the scene. Great fighters, freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. These guys were fucking cool. Yeah. They wanted to kick some ass. Yeah. And they weren't treated as, oh, well, you should not beat the shit out of your enemy. No, these were little Indian comic books. Very mm -hmm. interesting comic books. Yeah, it's very cool. And they influenced me. Yeah. I come with that story. I come with my grandmother. And after we land, we settled in Patterson, New Jersey. Mm. Still to this day, one of the poorest cities in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is the United States of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Vietnam is taking place. You turn on the TV, black and white TV. Yep. We, we got one from the Salvation Army. You <laughs> see soldiers being butchered on TV every day. 
body bags coming. Mm -hmm. You see riots, police beating the shit out of demonstrators. You see pictures of people protesting in the civil rights movement. That's what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I'm here in Patterson, New Jersey, which is predominantly all segregated blacks. Mm -hmm. We're considered quote unquote brown black. I'm in second grade. The school systems are tough. You have to learn how to fight because mm -hmm. people want to start fights. Yeah, You're yeah. the outsider yeah, yeah. coming from nowhere. It wasn't I was white and yeah. I wasn't black. I was yeah. brown. Yeah. So everyone was, picked on you. Yeah. Everyone picked on us, but you learned how to fight. And that's Patterson, New Jersey. When we came, we didn't have any clothes. We didn't prepare. A wonderful African-American woman took us to the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. You got all your clothes, books, and that's how our life started, by these very loving people who helped us. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, my dad, when he had arrived here in 69, he didn't have a place to stay. He was walking down the street and met a guy called Jesse Jenkins, who was a, a bass player, old man. He let my dad stay in his home, which was a dusty home my dad describes, music all around. Mm -hmm. He was very close friends with an interracial couple. The husband was black and the woman was white. He was a principal of a school. We ended up going to something called Thanksgiving to their homes. Mm -hmm. So here's this very, which in, an interracial couple was unheard of at that mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. In fact, when he died, they named the school after him. It's called Carter High School. I think it's in Wayne, New Jersey. Mm. I went for 30, 40 years and they were deeply devout Christians. People would pray before a meal. This was this environment, early formative years in this interracial world, Vietnam, protests in the streets, mm -hmm. in some ways chaos, but is no different than the chaos I grew up in Bombay. So I felt at home. Mm -hmm. And then my parents realized, wow, we came to America for our kids to get an education. Patterson, they're never going to get educated except our son getting in fights all the time. So we went to move to Clifton, New Jersey, because in the United States, my parents could never afford private schools, but my mother hated private schools. She thought it was like a segregation. She never believed in this bourgeois my parents moved to another mm -hmm. town called Clifton, New Jersey, mm -hmm. more of an integrated town, still very poor town, public school system. I did second to fourth grade there, but I had incredible teachers. I had a third grade teacher who taught me how to write, mm -hmm. expository writing in third grade. I will never forget that she gave a writing assignment and she held up my thing. She goes, Shiva did this writing assignment beautifully because it was a concept of a thesis statement, mm -hmm. the concept of making points on your thesis and expanding. By the way, very few people today even learn expository writing. It's crazy. I learned this at third grade. Yeah. So I know how to write, I know how to make an argument, but it was Mrs. Hall, she taught me that at third grade. Mm -hmm. Then in fourth grade, I had an amazing teacher who was into Eastern and Western meditation. Mm. When I left that school, she did a wonderful party for me. And then we moved to the next town called Lake Hiawatha, New Jersey. This is what age now? I think I must be 12. My dear mom's mother is dying. So me and my mom take off from school because she wanted me to be with her. Mm -hmm. We go back to India for three months. Mm -hmm. She was taking care of her mother. I went back to my village where my grandparents are. That's when you see, wow, the this huge difference. Yeah. Wait a minute. I had like cars, yeah. electricity, yeah. paved roads, mm -hmm. right? Running water where you have a toilet that you flush. Yeah. Here I'm back. There's no paved roads. There's freaking cobras out there. But you go up and you look up at the stars like you've never seen before. Yeah, you find God in places like that. Yeah. yeah. And everyone, you can walk the streets at any time. People yeah. love you. Yeah. That experience is when I realized this massive difference in wealth. My grandparents have no shoes. My grandmother works works in the field. She's got leeches on her feet. Then mm -hmm. that end of that trip, my grandparents come to a train station to see me off. And these are these old caboose trains, mm -hmm. like you see out of the Wild West. Mm -hmm. I'm looking through the window and I see my grandparents, my grandfather, I can still see them. Yeah. My grandfather and my grandmother crying because deep love, like I know. they may never see me. These people have very little, but they give everything they have. So you, re yeah. you realize this immense love for these people. You realize that those same people, whatever money they had, they educated my father. Mm -hmm. Like how little they they had, but they had this deep, deep love, mm. this deep sense of honor. When my uncle came back to that village, he became a doctor and he came to my grandmother for blessings. Mm. My grandmother asked him one question. She said, if someone poor comes to you and they have no money, will you heal them? Are you going to charge them? She goes, no, no, I'll heal them because medicine was supposed to be, you never charge. Yeah. Not one penny. Mm -hmm. She gave him her blessings, but this was this ethos that life was very ephemeral, that you were here for service and it was yeah. a direct connection to God. Right. Period. Period. It's a life that I think very few people experience. I was very, very fortunate to get that. But I remember looking through the, uh, that window and still I can see it. And I'm realizing if I don't do something with my life that helps these people and why is it my aunt is living in a four foot by four foot hut? Why is it they have so little yet they have bigger hearts than anyone I've ever seen? Yeah. And that deep connection, I remember a chill went through my spine. You could call it from my crown chakra yeah. to my base. Yeah. The decision was that I would become something to destroy this fire injustice mm -hmm. period it's time to shatter the swarm it's time for us it's time for one of us mm -hmm. truth freedom health shiva yeah. for president period 